Good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to see so many of you. It's uh, early, it's Friday, it's a bit rainy, but you're still here. So thank, thank you for that. My name is Anne, and I'm one of the folks who've been um, planning this event. And we've been looking forward to this day. I've been emailing with Christian, who is the main person today, for some years now. And we haven't been able to find a date for this event, but finally we're here. It's great. Um, I'm also happy to welcome Laurie Webb on stage with Christian. Um, she will be moderating this session today. She will be the one in charge of having all these questions asked that we want to know about Christian. I won't say many things, but I would like to introduce Laurie just in a few terms, and I'm sure she'll uh, make sure that Christian is uh, probably introduced. Laurie is an external uh, associate professor at DGU. She's also, also a professional speaker. She's an <coughs> author. She has written three number one bestsellers at Amazon, and now she is here today. So please welcome Laurie Webb and Christian Fierk. Okay, exciting times. Uh, it's my favorite topic in the whole world, entrepreneurship. So I am honored and very excited uh, to be here with you today and to share Christian. Christian, why don't you just sit down? We'll take it pretty easily today. Um, but we'll uh, jump right into it. Essentially, today's program is going to be really focused on hearing about Christian's story, idea to entrepreneurship. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a, I don't think I can say, even say hopefully, you will definitely be inspired. Uh, the question is, will you be motivated to go that direction? There's going to be ups and downs in the story. There's going to be, uh, we're going to dig into uh, Lots of things with Christian. I spoke to him when he was in New York a few days ago, and, and um, he said I could ask him whatever I want, so <laughs> let's see how it goes. <laughs> but his mother and father and his brother are here, so I'll tame the questions. Okay, so uh, we're going to do a, a court, a, a court, yeah, a short intro. Christian will introduce the company. Um, I'll finish with this, and then uh, we'll sit down, talk for about a half hour, and then open it up for questions. But before we get started with Christian, I'm going to say a little bit. In 2007, a small Danish team uh, had the idea to develop an app to integrate GPS-enabled telephones with fitness aspirations and social connection. At the time, none of the three colleagues had any experience. However, that did not stop them from creating a huge success with currently 23 million users. It's a fascinating story that is inspiring and uh, motivating and also has provided a great service for many of the world's uh, fitness enthusiasts who wanted to kind of keep track of what they're doing in their swimming, their running, their hiking. Uh, Christian will go into the details a little bit more. Uh, but about Christian himself, he is a former DTUer, so yay. <laughs> and perhaps also, um, uh, like you, he is a fitness uh, enthusiast. Uh, what probably is different from Christian and you and I is that Christian is very fast. In fact, Christian is one of the fa was one of the fastest 400-meter uh, uh, runners in the world. He's like the top 50, is that right? The Danish, hmm, kind of the top 50 runners. Uh, now, I bring that up. He, I he think he gets a little embarrassed about it, but I think it is very, very relevant in that, you know, that he would end up doing the company that he does, but that he has a deep insight to fitness, to running, that really helps, I believe, to help fuel why he would be so successful in, in creating what he created. And that's the same thing for all of you. You all have your specialties. You all have your, your uh, maybe something that you did on the side. Who knows? It might become a business. So, Christian, um, you spent some time at McKinley, and then you met your colleagues and decided to do this. He's going to tell a little bit more about the story, and I'll start asking questions again in just a few minutes. So, Christian, over to you.
Thank you. Uh, I'm not so technical, uh, <laughs> given my background. Um, did you hear what I said to begin with? Yeah. So, as said, I have a background from DCU, so I have a technical background. I also have a running background. Uh, I worked with the road races. I was a runner myself. And when, when you said, Laurie, that uh, not everyone are as fast as I was, at least there are some people. I can see back on the back rows there's a former Danish record holder on the short sprint. So uh, that's some years ago. But uh, I see one of my colleagues from, from Sparta, where I worked for, for many years. So I have a, a very big passion for running, very big passion for technology. And combining those two, that, that is the sweet spot of uh, working for me. So back in 2006, I started in uh, McKinsey. I had graduated in 2005. I worked at that time for a directorate, Vitex Water, uh, but wanted to do something completely different. Uh, I wanted to get a uh, more business sense. I had uh, tried to start a couple of companies. I'd failed in doing that. Uh, great experiences, uh, great learnings. Uh, so I, I joined uh, McKinsey & Company to uh, get a, uh, an education in financial modeling and stuff that I could use to start a company. Uh, I met up with two colleagues over the first uh, year, year and a half. We met up almost every Sunday, a, a group of 10 people. And the purpose of these uh, Sunday morning brunch was to come up with at least one idea, pitch that idea to the other in the group over the brunch, and then by after a year or so, we had a very long list of, of ideas, most of them not that great, but also some good ideas. Uh, Endomondo was one of them. So end of 2007, and it was in end of November, December 2007, we started Endomondo. We went full time. It was based on a uh, desire to create something that would make it more fun to do sports, something that could org organize unorganized sports, and socialize around a not so social event as running is. It's very it's very uh, socialized event in terms of road races, events, or even running clubs. But most people they they take their shoes and they go running. Um, so that was that was the aim. Uh, we looked at different trends, social communities. They were they were uh, growing at that time. Uh, Facebook had come to Denmark not that uh, long time before. Uh, so we said, what can we do? How can we use technology? We use technology all over in our daily life, but not so much in sports. In sports, not much has happened in technology and still hasn't. People will say there's tons of technology in sports. Uh, but if you look at how we do sports now compared to how we did the sports 40 years ago, it's, it's actually not that different. Um, so using GPS technology and using some sort of measure of all your metrics around doing uh, sports uh, or running, walking, skiing, biking, whatever the motion-based sport was, uh, that was what we wanted to do. So that was, that was the initial start we, we uh, got going in 2007. Uh, we launched the first Alpha, Alpha, Alpha product in 2008. I wouldn't say I'm proud of it. I was actually pretty embarrassed when we, uh, when I talked to folks. Uh, it didn't really work, um, but it was out there, and there were a lot of barriers. One of them was uh, phones. There were basically no phones with GPS in the market. Uh, I remember we looked at a Gartner report in 2007 when we started, and that report said by 2010 there will be 750,000 phones worldwide with GPS. So it was not a huge market to look into. But then luckily, uh, uh, Apple came along with a GPS phone, um, with the iPhone with GPS, and I think they sold something like six million in the, just the last half year of 2008. So luckily, the reports, they were completely inaccurate, which was our luck. So that was, that was a short uh, background for getting started. If, can I change from, uh, thank you. So I, I talked a little bit about what, what is the mission of, uh, of Endomondo. The mission is to motivate people. Um, using, using something that we all have in our pockets almost 24 hours a day, how can we use that to motivate people to, uh, to become more active? Um, 
I strongly believe that the best way to motivate people is to make something fun, fun and to use uh, peer pressure. Um, we all know that it is important to do sports. We all know it's important not to smoke, to eat healthy, not to drink, all those kind of things. We're not necessarily changing behaviors. We will, however, change behaviors when there is peer pressure, when other people know about what we're doing. Uh, I, at some point, uh, when I was a student and also a little after, I was commentating track and field on TV, on uh, a TV station. And we would get a lot of questions during marathon races. How do I get started? How do I run my first marathon? And I think one of the main advices is just tell as many people as possible. If you tell everyone you know that you're going to run a marathon, chances are that you are going to do it. And that's exactly the same here. If you start showing that you're doing stuff, you have this kind of peer pressure. There are people looking after what you're doing. So that's that's a, that's a mission, that's a background. That's why we wanted to create this. Today it is an ab application that runs on all the different platforms, and we can come back into that. We can come back into uh, uh, more details on, on the start. Uh, but it runs on all the platforms. Um, very important to, uh, to be agnostic of uh, what kind of phone people have. Um, in US, it's not as important. There are less different operating systems. In Europe, it was completely different at least uh, six years ago. Uh, and we have also integrated with a lot of different products. So if, even if you use a Garmin watch or any other kind of GPS watch, we have tried to integrate uh, to get the uh, data into the system. Just a few numbers before uh, we uh, go into uh, to, to, to talk more about the company. Uh, the company we have uh, 26 million people have uh, downloaded the application. Uh, roughly 18 million people are members, meaning members of the society, uh, people that we communicate with. Um, U.S. is the biggest country standalone, um, but compared to Europe, Europe is the biggest uh, place, and. In, in Europe, it is countries uh, like UK, the Scandinavian countries, Poland and Spain are the by far biggest countries. Why is Spain so big? We don't know. We have actually no idea. Spain is growing. Um, maybe it's because of the name. Um, maybe it's because of, of other things. Unfortunately, we have seen a correlation with unemployment, different places, uh, that people start running when uh, the unemployment rate goes up. Um, but that's all speculations. We, we don't have exact answers for why. Um, the most popular sports are running. We wanted to create a product for recreational people. We have people that uh, are professional athletes. We have Tour de France uh, bike riders that are using the product, but it's not meant for elite sport. It's meant for people that like to go running, like to just work out and stay healthy. Uh, running is the biggest one. Cycling and walking are also big. But then we have another 40, 40 sports that people use. They track their, uh, they put in the tennis or the basketball, the swimming. It's kind of hard to, to swim with the phone. I'm probably one of the only one who has actually done that. I, I did some outdoor swimming and I did put it, the phone in a plastic bag under my swim cap. Uh, that way I could swim with it in a, in a river. Um, it is a product where we have more men than women. Uh, now it says 63% are men. Um, that's much, much better than it used to be. In the beginning, it was more like 90 to 10. I think there are two main reasons. One is men in general, and I'm in general a little more tech savvy and want to try out their products that especially are going to be shown to other people. Uh, in the beginning, we were also doing a lot of mistakes on how you show your data, uh, how fast you're running, uh, all those kind of things that some, and now I'm generalizing a lot, but we could see on the data that men were much more willing to share how fast they're running than women are. Um, it was a company mainly made by men. We were three people, one woman and two, uh, two guys, um, and we were sharing everything. So when we started changing that, a lot of dynamics, and we can go into those de details as well, it, it changed. Today, it's almost 50-50 in the new uh, member base, but there's still a, um, 
and, and over-representation of men. We have tried to use different channels, Facebook one of them, uh, where you can share your data, you can share your routes. It is a bragging platform. That is uh, the biggest driver of new members. That is because we all like to brag about what we do. Uh, whether it is talking about it over lunch that I went running yesterday, or I did a half marathon, I did uh, go for a five kilometer run yesterday, we all like to talk about that. And that is what we're using when we're trying to get new members. I think that's that. That was the uh, that was the uh, the key stats and a few elements around the product. Um, the, it, the company is still based uh, here in Copenhagen. Uh, we have had offices in Poland and in US, um, but the main office is in is in Copenhagen. Uh, we moved it at some point to US, uh, but moved it back to uh, to Denmark. <coughs> and the main reason was. Uh, qualified people to uh, work for the company. It was just much easier to find really good people here in Copenhagen than it is most places in the US. Hmm? Thanks. 40, 40 people. Yeah. So, well, let's get into it. First and foremost, why Endomundo? It's actually extremely hard to find a name. <laughs> um, not only to come up with the name, but also to find a name where you can get the .com, .org, mm -hmm. all the domain addresses. So, uh, before answering your question, we, uh, when we were in the process of finding a name, we made a little uh, model in a spreadsheet and tried to combine all different kinds of words and map that up against a domain database. Uh, and I think we went through about 4,000 different names. Uh, we couldn't find names. So Endomondo suddenly came out of what is it that, what is the thing you produce when being physically active, which is endorphins. Yeah. And Mondo is, we wanted to create a product that was global. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mondo is for the world, so it's a world full of endorphins. Okay. That was how it, it came up. Okay. So in in your from when you had the idea to when you guys got going, uh, how did you navigate this? You had no experience with building an app. It was actually early to be building an app. Yeah. So what were the drivers for for doing that? Um, the drivers were the pain points for the user. Mm -hmm. It was my own pain point. I wanted to. I wanted to capture my data. I wanted to uh, compare and compete, even though I was not meeting up with the people I could uh, compete with every uh, Tuesday afternoon. Um, so, so that was the reason behind it. It was more based on a need for, for something. Uh, when we started thinking about it in 2007, about this idea, mm -hmm. there was nothing out there. When we launched the product in 2008, there were a couple of other uh, products, but it was mainly products with a GPS, big clunky GPS watches, not uh, not the phones. Um, building an app was trying to build a product that everyone could use and have access to without paying two, three, four hundred dollars. Um, of course, that's what you pay for your phone, but we thought. You have your phone anyway. It's not. Uh, it's not. That's not a huge barrier to get started. Right. Okay. And uh, your engineering background. How? What role would you say that it pl has played in in navigating this course? I think uh, it hasn't played a role in terms of the actual coding or um, the the te technology behind it. It has more played a role in the fact of. Okay, this is a problem. How do we how do we mm -hmm. come up with some sort of solution that we can use that can solve this problem? This problem being, I want to track my my runs instead of just writing it down on a piece of paper, and I want to use that to to share with other people. Um, so that problem solving exercise uh, is definitely something that comes from my background from here. Okay, uh, and your co-founders, they're. They all came from McKinsey, 
and you all bring different things to the table. So how did, when you were constructing your, your team, I mean, you're, you were the, the lead co-founder, you were the, the runner who had the pain, who wanted it solved, and then figured out who should I work with. How did that, was it, did it start actually reverse? Did you meet these colleagues and decide, oh, one day we should do something? You, you talked about having your, your brunches and things like that, but these two particular co-founders, were they kind of the right match? Or how did that work? Yeah, so it, it was actually more, it was a combination of, um, of meeting up and coming up with some ideas. We knew that we wanted to create something. Mm -hmm. And the exercises every Sunday morning, having brunch, coming up with an idea, talking to the other people about mm -hmm. those ideas, and then uh, having the other people around the table telling how bad an idea it was. That was a great exercise to get started. And we, we came up with a list of, I think, 30, 40 ideas. Any, anything from uh, packaging for, for food and pizzas and uh, into, into Indomundo being one of them. Uh, and we tried to rank all those ideas and, and said, what is, it, what is the potential? And a lot of people disagreed on that because we ranked Endomondo really high on potential, on the market potential, um, but we also ranked it on what are, what are our capabilities, uh, what can we bring to the table, can we as a group bring something to, to the table in that product. And then the third uh, dimension was, um, was the passion. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely important, especially for me, to, to rank really high. And this, I clearly have a huge passion. I love running, I love sports. Um, so that's, uh, that was where this, this product scored really high and that was the same for everyone. Then we had different, uh, we came with different backgrounds, all had passion for creating something that would make it more fun to do sports. Everyone had the same pain point, so to speak. Okay, I think it's, um, it was a, uh, a bit of a good analogy, I, I think is, is a good analogy. You talked about running and how people, you know, get started, it's a good idea to just kind of tell everybody I'm going to run, I'm going to run a marathon next year. And the peer pressure, the, the accountability, one would say as well. And when I was listening to you say that I've um, done some interviews with some entrepreneurs and I have also been a runner, not in your league, but the idea of going into an entrepreneurial endeavor is much like preparing for a marathon or it's that same kind of concept. Would you say that that's, uh, that, that would also hold true if you're thinking about doing a business that you kind of spread it out there, uh, it can be maybe counterintuitive because many people are afraid to share their information and, and share their great idea because maybe it'll get stolen. Yeah. What's your take on that? Sh sharing ideas is very frightening because you think that sharing an idea means that now you will have all those competitors out there and they're going to do it. <coughs> so actually in the beginning, with all our ideas, we had drafted up, none of us uh, were lawyers, but we had, we had no money, so we had to draft up our own documents, so we had made those uh, non-disclosure agreements every time we went to a meeting, even when I went down to uh, talk to the local uh, bike, bike store, I would bring this piece of paper, you cannot share the information, which in hindsight is completely ridiculous, um, because it's, not about, it's actually not about the idea, and you have to talk to people, and anyway, as soon as you launch it, it's gonna be out there anyway. Um, but that was our fright of, of, of t talking about it. Mm -hmm. But then at some point we realized, okay, this is actually, it's not a unique idea. It's not that other people haven't thought about it. It's just about executing it and doing it. Um, so we stopped sharing all the documents and have people sign. Of course, I'm not saying that, that you should share everything because there are things you shouldn't share, and there are companies, uh, startups, that you just can't share. But in this case, we just have to talk to, we had to talk to people. We right. had to get out there. And, and the other driver was people saying that this is the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. Uh, what are you talking about? Why are you leaving a good job with a good paycheck and don't get a paycheck and all those kind of things? And for, for that, that's, that sounds stupid. Um, and that was also a driver because now we really wanted to prove that it is possible. It is a good idea. Okay, so uh, another issue can often be the timing of, of when you start something. 
and you started early. So would you say that, I mean, if you started Edmonton Home Window now, I mean, now there are more people with uh, GPS-enabled telephones. People understand the whole idea. Of, I mean, people have lots of apps on their telephones. Uh, people also, I believe, the, the, the health care, wellness um, trend has really hit, so there are even more mm. uh, people. Do you think that the timing of when you got started, you were a first mover, um, and that inc incurs a certain amount of... Uh, hard, hard, hard uh, laying the, the groundwork. So can you tell us a little bit about from there to, to now where you're kind of in the sweet spot where people are able to simply just go, I mean, I went and downloaded mine the other day and I haven't used it yet, but it's, it's it. um, <laughs> as soon as everyone thinks it's a good idea, then it's probably too late. Um, and starting it now would be very difficult because now there are at some point there are thousands of players in the game mm -hmm. uh, all different kind of sports tracking apps and there's still but there are only four or five big ones six ones maybe uh, worldwide um, so it's still a game but getting into that game now on this particular product of course something else is a different story but for this product it is um, it would be difficult I think we started probably at the right time. Mm -hmm. We were debating whether we should, should we work longer so we can save up more money, so we have more money to get started. Uh, we, w we went very early on to talk to venture capital uh, people because we thought this is such a great idea. Of course, they're going to put lots of money in it uh, already before we even have a product, which was <coughs> absolutely not the case. And a lot of people said, maybe why don't you wait two, three years? Because then the penetration of phones with GPS is going to be so much bigger that it's going to be easier. Um, we could maybe have waited a little bit, but I think we were at the right time. Okay. Um, so it is very much about timing. And, and I do think back to the question, if, if everyone thinks it's a good idea, it's too late. Okay. So what about venture capitalists? And what about the financing for, for the company? very very tough <laughs> <laughs> uh, because especially when you think you have a great idea that and, uh, and I said not everyone share share your views on that uh, secondly um, they want to see money why do you make money and for this particular company we didn't make money for a very long time um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of users into a system before you have that critical mass of actually being able to share and and it's just really difficult to sell a an online product it's getting a little easier people are getting used to pay to pay for apps or for online products but it has been very very hard um, so before going back to the question on funding uh, just to give you a sense that at some point we tried to make money by e-commerce, by selling different things, by selling heart rate monitors. Um, and the funny thing is we would sell those heart rate monitors for about a thousand Danish crowns, 800 Danish crowns, something like that. Uh, and no one would complain, even though they would use the app maybe every day. They would use the heart rate monitor every other month. They would pay $100, $150 for the heart rate monitor. We would never hear anything, any complaints. The app was, at that time, 20 crowns or 25 crowns. People, and that's a one-off. <laughs> so it's roughly a half cup of coffee. And a lot of people say, that's way too expensive. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's, so that okay. is just a mental element around how much do you want to pay for things. That is changing, mm -hmm. uh, but it was definitely a different case uh, three, four years ago. In terms of funding, we thought, again, it was great idea we thought everyone would put money into it and we went to some venture capital firms and they said oh, when you have 20,000 users let's talk again and that's that was the first time we had maybe 17 users all our uh, closest friends but uh, um, then we we reached the 20,000 mark and uh, went back and said yeah when you have 100,000 then you're right in the right spot we went back when we had 100,000, yeah, yeah, when you have 500,000. <laughs> so it just kept moving and moving and moving. Luckily, we were able to attract some friends and family um, um, investors 
that did put in money. Um, and th that kept us going for a long time. Uh, we didn't have salaries for the first two years. Um, all the folks that we hired, they went down, I don't know, 60, 80% in salaries. And we gave them this completely kind of hot air shares. Uh, we said, oh, we, you will get some options or shares in the company, and maybe it will turn out to be something, maybe it will turn out to be nothing. And uh, no one knows, but they took a leap of faith. Uh, some really good folks that just wanted to create something new. Uh, so funding-wise, we were fortunate, but some private individuals that did put in money, and, and it was money in the 50, 100,000 crown range that mm -hmm. would carry on for a very long time. Of course, that's very yeah. different when you have 40 people and everyone has uh, salaries, but yeah. at that time it was. So um, would you say, I mean, do you follow, like, did you, when you started up, did you use, like, a lean process? Uh, obviously, a lot of people used uh you know, sweat equity in, in getting started. So that helped with, with the economy of the company from the beginning. Uh, but did you use any particular practices? Did you, you know, follow any kind of, you know, did you write your business plan? Did you use a, a, a business model canvas? Did you, you know, use the, uh, the napkin we, uh, technique? How did you get going? Yeah, so we... Uh, and I still have all the business plans from day one. And I think it's, if I had to take the latest one, it's probably version 752, uh, I don't know, something like that. So we have changed it quite a lot. The idea behind has not actually changed, which I'm a little surprised. Uh, things around it has changed. Mm -hmm. The numbers have changed dramatically. Uh, the first business plan was, we're gonna attract users, we're gonna have X hundred million users, uh, uh, this percentage is going to pay and uh, we are going to be hugely millionaires in two years. B by the way, we're going to make money already in three months. Yeah. All those kind of things. And, and the startup is also a little romanticized. You hear about all those great stories and reality is that there are very few good stories. Uh, luckily, we hear about them, but it's m most of the time it's just extremely hard work. So we try to be very lean, uh, s s did not spend any money on anything. Uh, we got help from so many people, so I'm in depth up to here for <laughs> helping other people for the rest of my life, but all the people around us helped us with all different kinds of, of things. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the marketing. Uh, so w what was your approach in getting started? How did you... You know, you uh, you were ambitious. You wanted to go worldwide. You succeeded. So, can you give us some insights into how do you take a a small little Danish company and grow it into a huge <laughs> international success? I think there were two things that we upfront agreed upon in terms of making it an international company. One was we wanted to create it in English. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, definitely not my strong side. That was not my favorite uh, topic in, in school. Uh, so writing everything in English, uh, doing everything in, in English was was difficult, but we wanted to create something where people would say to me, wow, is it Danish? That was kind of the ambition. Mm -hmm. um, and then we wanted to hire a team that was non-Danish. It was not that we tried to only find non-Danish people, but uh, one of our advisors was one of the early folks behind Skype and he said if you want to create an international company you want an international crowd yeah. and that is so true yeah. uh, because it's just the mentality it's just uh, sitting in a group I think at some point we were 19 nationalities mm -hmm. uh, and that just created this environment of not trying to be the best thing Copenhagen or in Denmark, but have a company that was global when it comes to languages. And I, I actually do think to this day is one of our advantages because our main competitors are all, except for one, all American companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are very, of course, it's a huge market, but they're very US centric. Yeah. So just bring it in into another language. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's something that is not in the DNA of most American entrepreneurs. Of course, they have 300 million plus people, so it's it's easy. 
but we have it in, in so many languages and, and trying to create that global product. Right. That seems like a good strategy that worked for you. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the personal element because now you are, you're currently back at McKinley mm -hmm. and the reason for that um, we'll get into is because for somebody who doesn't want to speak English now, he has to speak English all the time. <laughs> uh, you, how did, when, in the uh, story, did you meet your wife? Um, about 24 hours after I moved to U.S. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the, the, I, we were back and forth in U.S. So we moved the company to California. Uh, the main reason was because we were selling, we were making money out of selling T-shirts, uh, heart rate monitors, and those kind of things. And we sold to a lot of uh, American users. So we wanted to set up an office in U.S. so we could sell it out of there and avoid the customs and all those things. Um, then later, and that was in San Diego, we moved that up to San Francisco um, because we thought that's the place to be. We need to be in San Francisco. That's where all the venture capital is. It's all where all the partners is, uh, are, and it's all uh, all the good developers. And that's the latter part is also true. There are good developers. There are great developers. But there's also fierce, fierce, fierce competition. Um, we couldn't compete with Twitter, Facebook, Google in, in terms of salaries. Uh, so we could get the good developers, but they were just insanely expensive. And then that's it's all it also attracts San Francisco area attracts also a lot of not so good developers. It's just a uh, so we moved that back to Denmark because here we can get great folks, a lot of people from from this is institution, really really good people, and even though they are have higher salaries than the average Dane, then they still they cannot compare to the high salaries in, in the Silicon Valley area. Mm -hmm. But back to your question, I moved to to San Francisco to sign my lease on my apartment the day after I was in a conference in New York and I met my now wife okay. in, uh, in New York. And uh, then I was commuting back and forth and when we moved back the company back to Copenhagen, uh, the main activities, uh, we had a little discussion if we should stay in US or His in wife is American. My we wife is American. Just yeah. for the record, yeah. yes. Yeah. And and you're having trouble getting her to come to Denmark because you keep showing her Denmark when it's cold we and rainy. <laughs> we have been here sometimes uh, when it hasn't been that great of a weather. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, but New York is definitely not a bad uh, second choice. That's why we live now. Yeah. Uh, and I know it's, it's kind of funny <laughs> to be in this situation. It's very bizarre. <laughs> it's kind of a reverse story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, yeah. you. Um, Y the reason that I wanted to bring that up, I mean, we spoke about it on the phone, but for the crowd is that the importance of when you're thinking, when you're taking your idea from just an idea to a company, a lot of times you're, you, you think in the business terms. But the fact of the matter, I mean, I, th I believe actually, and no matter whether you're working for a company or you're working for yourself, that it's always personal. Your life is always a part of your business. You always have it with you, and especially in this 24-7 kind of contact world. But with the entrepreneurial journey, it's very, very important the way that your personal life unfolds and develops and that you have the support of the family members and that it influences, in your case, that you ended up leaving to, because you couldn't... You had to kind of make a choice. Yeah. Now... Now I'm really going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Are you glad you made that choice? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad. And I think one thing that, that, that pros and cons by living in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, but one of the big pros is uh, the fact that it's just people are really encouraging entrepreneurship. Um, I, I, I do think we are getting much better, mm. much, much better. Here in Denmark. Here in yes. Denmark. But mm -hmm. I... As an example, and this is not to talk bad about one country or against another country, but I was met with the, when we started here, I was met constantly with the fact that people said, so did you get fired? You couldn't find a job? Um, that was a completely different approach in when I talked to American people. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> and and it's, that is a different culture uh, to entrepreneurship. Uh, to startup companies, and that I just I like that. There's that there's endless possibilities. 
uh, I think we are getting so much better. More companies are starting up. Uh, the scene in Copenhagen is great. There's a lot of entrepreneurship uh, focus on the universities mm -hmm. here as well. Yeah. So that's that's really, really good. Uh, even though a lot of people might go and have a corporate job, it's still it's still a good mindset to have, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a good decision. And uh, it's not that we can come back to Denmark. We can do that. So... And you're spending your time, we were talking about also, and, and while you're working, if you have an idea, if you have aspirations, you mentioned um, when you were working at McKinley, you got a lot of, a lot of uh, connections and, and insights into kind of honing your skills before going that route. So especially for people who just left school and are thinking, well, should I go for a business or should I go for a job? There's pluses and minuses to, to doing either or. Yeah, definitely lots of pluses and minuses. But one of the huge pluses I got out of my sh f uh, fairly short experience with McKinsey & Company, it was about a year and a half, two years in Copenhagen mm -hmm. before we started, was a great network. Mm -hmm. Just uh, First of all, I felt going into that kind of a consulting job, that's definitely not me. I would mm -hmm. much rather like to to just work on math and do and and but i realized that a lot of people uh, most people they felt that way too so i now have a lot of good friends and it was a great network and uh, it's a good way to know people in different parts of industry mm -hmm. and that was the reason since i left endomondo on the day-to-day -day operations a year ago a little more than a year ago um, it was to get the same situation for myself in a new place mm -hmm. and that has worked out really well in new york to get to know people because i think that's the hardest part about starting something one thing is having the idea uh, if you do it by yourself and a lot of people do then it's great uh, for many other people it's just there's so many rough days and so many days where it's where you just want to quit that mm -hmm. if you are a group of people and can help each other then it makes it so much easier Okay, um, are, are you getting ready with your questions? Because let's, uh, let's move over. We, I'm sorry, just a second. We're going to put a mic on you so everyone can hear the question. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm very curious to hear about your perception of risk in terms of starting up. Because uh, I can understand that you started up some years ago. Uh, so at that time, what, what uh, would you consider was your risk back then? What could you lose? And imagine if you should do it 15 years later, then what is then your perception of risk? Because, of course, everybody knows that the more established you are in life, uh, then uh, the more you have at stake. Uh, what's your, could you elaborate a bit on, on that? Yeah, so I think that two, I'll, I'll split it up into two answers. One is the personal risk of dropping a job um, and, and starting something up. That risk for me is almost zero. Yeah, you, you won't have salary, and but you're still learning. Learning a lot, and I don't think you put yourself in a worse position by trying to start a company and failing. And that's probably what keeps most people back, the, the risk of failing. Because what about if you fail? And that was the same way when I was a, running, when I was a runner. I want to be the Olympic champion. That didn't happen, pretty far from it. Uh, but uh, but that was not a failure. It was It's just to get started and get something up and running and maybe it'll take off maybe it won't the risk part on on having a family or doing it later in life is of course if you have commitments you have a family and you have kids and then it's a different different situation uh, when we started it was it was it was fairly easy we could we could almost live without too much money uh, so the risk picture was more on the financial side uh, and of course it's you have to to loan a lot of money and having that sort of depth in your follow you for a very long time that's just that's rough but that's no different than people buying a house or doing other things uh, so that risk picture is f that's fairly limited but I think that is a big difference doing it when you are right out of school or if you are having uh, kids that are in school and 
all those kind of things. Uh, I don't know if it really answered your question, uh, but that's my perspective on it. Okay, we had some more questions over here. Yeah, I'm very interested in, uh, can you tell us about, maybe not exactly for Indomondo, but like the app world, now you have 18 million users, and how do you turn them into paying for 40 people working for you? And as more, wha who are your paying customers? Mm -hmm. You don't have to name them, but in general terms, yeah. like in TV a couple of days ago, we saw that one Facebook pages with 50,000 likes, you can sell for 50,000 kroner. But it doesn't really seem like that a repetitive business, and, but you are in a repetitive business. So how, how do you get revenue and how do you plan to stay to get revenue? That's now, now that's the same question as, as I had uh, the first couple of years when we started. <laughs> and it is such an important and very good question. Uh, because how do you get revenue, especially, especially starting up a company where there is no clear price for the product uh, and you have a vision for what will it turn into. Um, I think uh, recurrent revenue by subscriptions, that's, that is what is working uh, for Intermondo. But that means that you have to constantly innovate the product. It has to be a new product. If people are, are paying 100, 200 crowns a year, whatever, for um, just in general for a service, it has to constantly be better and better and better. You ju just cannot have an online product that stays the same, just like you have other products. Um, in terms of, of uh, revenue, we have tried s all different kind of things, uh, and most of it didn't work. But no one, we couldn't find the book saying what should you do on revenue, so we just had to try a lot of things. Um, I think in the app world, when we started, it was very early days for, for all the app stores. A couple of uh, three, four years ago, it was all about selling an app, so having a free app, and then you could get some additional features in an app and you would pay $5 or something. Uh, and that's also a one-off. It's not a great long-term business model unless you constantly increase, uh, increase your user base. Um, having a, um, a subscription-based model where you where you have recurrent revenue in uh, is probably right now the best way of running the business to to make sure that you have enough money for the salaries and, and those uh, those kind of things. Um, but it it comes with the cost of you have to be on your toes all the time and change the product. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I agree, and I think the perception around apps is: oh, you have an app, you have many users, you must be uh, m you must be a hugely millionaire. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, it's uh, that tons of companies with lots lots of users that are not making mon money out of it. Uh, just think about our own behavior. Uh, we're not that willing to pay for stuff on the phone. It's getting better, and more and more are actually paying and and. If you buy additional services, and uh, and there are some companies that are really good at it, but uh, but it is one of the big, big, big challenges how to make money on it, and especially in an environment that is changing. Um, the business models or the revenue models for the app stores, meaning uh, the app store on iPhone or Google Play and Google or or BlackBerry, or which markets, Windows markets, they are changing all the time as well. Uh, because two years ago, or even one year ago, you couldn't make a subscription model through an app store. Um, now that's the way to do it on the app store. So, that's, so you just have to change your business model all the time, which, which is challenging. I, I unfortunately don't have the the right answer to how to do it, but it's, it's, you have to be on your toes and change the things. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. <laughs> it is really tough, yeah. Yes? Um, 
I would like to know your view on crowdfunding. First, if crowdfunding had existed, I guess it did in the US, but it was unknown in Denmark in 2007. Had it existed, would you then have been more willing to, to share your ideas early to get funding? And what about today? Would you en encourage people to actually share their ideas and get some crowdfunding into start up a company? That's, that's a very <laughs> good and very tough question. Uh, and I think we would have shared, so to, to take it first, we would have shared it. We, we would have shared, we actually tried to make our own little crowdfunding before it was crowdfunding, just getting a group of friends to send it out to their friends and tell them about when we couldn't get money in, we said, okay, you can buy a share for 5,000 crowns or 2,000 crowns. And then we pull all this, this big group of people together. So it was a, a micro, micro uh, a subset for crowdfunding. We didn't have the crowdfunding sites. Um, it's very, very good for some products, but it can also be challenging, I think, for a lot of physical products that are using crowdfunding. We try to do crowdfunding for uh, some physical products. We try to make heart rate monitors. We have tried to make, we have made clothes, uh, clothes uh, running gear. Um, that's why it becomes challenging because when you buy a product through a crowd Kickstarter or Indiegogo or some of those sites, you tend to sell your product for a uh, lower price than it would other otherwise be. Uh, that doesn't mean that your cost of producing stuff is going to go down. Um, so it, it's great to get the money up front. You're basically just selling at a lower value. And you get the money before you actually have the cost, which is great. But it also puts a lot of pressure on your production. Uh, so I've seen a lot of a lot a lot of companies that actually succeeded in getting crowdfunding, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, which is great. But then suddenly they have to deliver, and and the cost always tends to be a little higher than you expected, and then it's hard to deliver. Um, so I'm talking a little outside your question. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's a very good idea, and I think a lot of uh, companies are benefiting from it. Would we have used it today? Yeah, we would probably have tried it. I wouldn't be afraid of sharing, because as soon as your service is out there, it's out there anyway. Uh, of course, you have to be a little careful what to share in your crowdfunding message, but uh, we would definitely have, have tried it. Uh, we have a question in the back, and we have a question on the side, and we have a question over there. Yeah, hi. Um, you were telling us that you have were 10 people meeting for lunches on Sundays. Why did you start your company with a subset of those people? Or indeed, how do you start with a team? How do you put it together? Is it good friends or is it uh, going by uh, qualifications or how do you do it? Uh, <laughs> good question. I think it, it was, first of all, your first question, why was it not 10 and only three? It was not the same group of 10, it was some people, and, and most people are not willing to, uh, to start a company for, for multiple reasons. We actually had one that started up with us for the first, so we were four when we started the first two months, but he was about to have a uh, baby and starting a family and not yes. having salary <laughs> and uh, back to the risk, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, which is completely understandable. And that's the case for most people. Uh, if you have your mortgages and your house or you have that multiple reasons. Um, I, I do think in terms of setting the team, it's of course you have to be able to work together and you have to be able to, uh, to share things, but it's also a matter of finding the right capabilities. Um, and the first people we tried to get on board, and we actually did that on day two or day three, was the top-notch best developers I knew. And it took a very long time to, to convince them to join. Um, so we didn't succeed in getting them on board. I would have loved to have a bigger team with more star developers from day one. Um, it, it is just very important to have different capabilities. And, but I think common for everyone was the passion. 
uh, both for creating something, but also for the product, and which is uh, the key question when hiring people as well. Um, and of course, uh, has they have to be really good, but the attitude is so so important because that's uh, that's so difficult to change. Okay, um, right in front of you, Anne. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the actual production of the first in the month version. Uh, you talked about it a little bit before about finding star developers, but how, how did you go about it? What kind of skills did you need? What what things did you outsource, and what did you really learn from from producing the first version of Endermundo? Um, so the very very first version that was a kind of a joint venture or a partnership with another company. Um, and we have tried to outsource quite a lot of times to save costs, to make it e cheaper, and and using uh, developers in lower lower cost countries. Um, we got a lot of experience and a lot of good learnings. We didn't get a good product out of it, and that's not because it's bad people or it's bad companies. It's just because when you want to create something that's new and innovative, and you change it all the time. A, it's impossible to write down what you want. It is a completely iterative process. You change it all the time. You can even sit over lunch and then you change it and then the next day it's different. That is impossible when your developers are in the Philippines or in Ukraine or somewhere. Um, uh, the first version of the product or the people that we wanted on board, that was people that were extremely good developers I didn't really care what language or what they had done before. Uh, people that were extremely passionate about the product so they could be the ones going for a run and coming up with ideas. Um, and, and, and people that just wanted to succeed in, in creating this. Um, so I think that is, that's back to the, to the attitude and to the mindset. Of course, the skill base has to be there. That's a given. Um, but we would actually rotate people on uh, on on platforms so it was sometimes something new um especially especially in the beginning um because most people that are really good at something they want to be better and they want to learn and they want to try something new and they want to be going into a new platform or whatever it is so the first production, the f very first production was uh, was more or less outsourced or partnered, and then the second production was our own, uh, made by people who just ha had a passion for the product. I'm just going to add a little bit to that, or or ask you a little bit more into it, because we've been talking about you know it's an app, and so we talk about developers, but there are a lot of people who don't understand how that process works, and I'm. I have a degree in IT, so I'm a little bit of a, a nerd in this area. But, you know, did you, when you decided how that you wanted the app, then you had to have some ideas about functionality. You had to have some ideas about design. You had to have some ideas, of course, about the coding, which is more the development area. Did you do wireframing? Did you, did you kind of draw pictures on, uh, okay, it should be like this. Okay, here's a little telephone, and I, we think that a button here, you can press here. Did you, did you do any mock-ups within the team and then put it out to the developers, or did you kind of throw, the, say, we, wanna <laughs> we want an app. You guys just, did you outsource the whole thing, or did you? In, in the beginning, uh, where it's a little different from when the production is bigger and later right. on, uh, we would never draw anything out and just send it to someone. People, everyone would be involved in it, right. would be part of it. And of course, people have different skill sets. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not claiming that I'm a, uh, uh, good on the design or on the development. It was probably more just the facilitation of the mm -hmm. process. But just to give an example on, um, on, on a clash on design, it, it's nice to have an app that's light and has a good look and feel. And some of our top developers, they were extremely good and it's great friends and really, and they, they said, no, it has to be black. It mm -hmm. has to be all black mm -hmm. because that's the only way we're going to save battery life. Mm -hmm. If we have it white, we're going to use too much battery, which yeah. completely makes sense. Uh, but yeah. it's just, it looks ugly. It looks <laughs> bad. You know, 
when you're on the App Store, you want to have something that people see and they get it, then they have five seconds before choosing your app or another app. Yeah. So it, it was some of those discussions that have been all the time uh, between what what is the right functionality versus design versus that. So many, many elements into it. So we have changed it a million times over, over time. And, and one, one comment in the beginning, it was really, really hard to change something. We had, let's say, 2,500 users. And we were so afraid of disappointing those users because maybe that would be 100 people that wouldn't like it. And there are always people that don't like it. Mm -hmm. We would change a tiny little thing and we would get emails for the next four days about this is completely ridiculous. It was a good product, now it's a bad product. We changed <laughs> like a font or line or a color or something. That's just how it is. And we were way too afraid of doing things when we had 2,000 users. Yeah. Um, that also speaks to the, the need to have some thick skin because oh people yeah. will complain yeah. about what, you yeah. <laughs> what you're doing yeah. and you have to be able to manage that yeah. as well. I'm sorry, sir, did you have a question as well? Yeah, so uh, the question is, it was very interesting to hear uh, about you meeting up every Sunday to create bold ideas. And uh, I think that I was thinking about is, I mean, now along the way where the company is more mature uh, and you are trying to get recurrent revenue from your clients, I mean, how do you uh, keep up uh, getting the good ideas and bringing them into the production and life and delivering on them? Are you uh, still having the list in the company or are you getting inspiration from the outside or is there a group of clever people within the company? So I would like to hear, to hear some thoughts about that. Could you hear that? Could you hear that? They didn't yeah, no. quite hear it. Um, just to kind of paraphrase, it was a he was asking to how they continue to get the good ideas. Very, very briefly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's very difficult. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier to come up with something that's not really out there and you come up with an idea, either people like it or they don't like it. Um, having something and having expectations from a group of users to constantly evolve and come up with new changes is difficult. I think the best way to do it, and I'm not, I'm not s uh, saying that um, it's always done perfectly, not at all, but the best way to do it is to have all the people working on it are the passionate users as well. Uh, so they come up with ideas. It's, it's, it has always been extremely important for us to take the group and go for a, we, we signed up for a, a bike race in Sweden and we'd go uh, 15 people from the company and most of the ideas they came on the way back in the car uh, talking about ah oh, we should have had this feature we should have it would have been nice with this um, of course also listening to the users and and but but you just get so many inputs i i don't know the numbers but it's hundreds of inputs about you should do this we should do this we should do this and it's all true and if we had 2,000 developers, maybe we could do half of it, but with 40 people, it's impossible. Um, so I think to constantly innovate and change, it, it has to come from the people using it. Uh, you have to collect ideas, you have to be very open to, uh, to feedback, but eventually people that are coding it are more passionate about coding something <laughs> that they like themselves, or <laughs> I, I, which is a pain point for that person. Um, how do you find those people? It's difficult, but it's just it has to be part of the process of setting the team and finding the people. Um, I don't know if it answered your question exactly because I can't give you the right answer. This is how to do it, uh, but I think that's the key elements, uh, and then the different levels of execution on that. Did that? Roughly answer. Well, it seems that you s you s also said you're you're in the field all the time. Yeah. You, the people in the in the team are always out there using the product, always testing the yeah. product, always interfacing with your users. Yeah. So, whether it's official or unofficial, you're actually getting user feedback. Yeah. So yeah. that that can always which be is super important. Which is yeah. something that not all companies do. Yeah. 
So and it's also harder when you grow and you become bigger. It is just harder. It's, uh, I'm not yeah. saying that big companies, they're just bad at it. It's just harder. Sir? I'm uh, interested in, in where is Endemonda going? Because often you uh, uh, put people in two categories, either uh, runners or starters. Mm. Of course, you are a starter. And starters often get bored when the company is running. What's your next project? That, that was the, <laughs> that, that's an uh, excellent question. It's actually two questions. Where is it going and what is my next project? <laughs> uh, I keep my own list. To start with the latter question, I keep okay. my own list of uh, good ideas, or at least what I think is good ideas. Um, and there's always something. Um, right now, I'm trying to find the right people to, uh, to help, whether it is in one year from now or five years from now or two weeks from now, that I don't know. Um, where is uh, the company? Company is, is still working on the same mission of making it fun to do sports, motivating people. It's becoming harder to do. It's back to, to your question. Uh, how do you constantly find some new ways? And, and the user base that are there now, a lot of them are early adopters, early starters. They're into it, and then they're looking for something else. And what is the next thing? Um, and, and going back to what I heard about... Uh, a company like Skype, one of the early, I mentioned earlier, one of the early people there said, he still to this day hear about people that are saying, wow, you can actually, you can talk over the computer, that's pretty cool. So you have a long tail of people that think, okay, this is completely old stuff. I still meet people that think, this is so amazing that you can take a phone and you can actually track where you are. Uh, you, can, you can use it, you can see the data afterwards. Um, so there is, a, 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 there's a lot of levels in the maturity of users and there will still be a lot of users that are signing up now and think it is the newest thing. Some of the users thought it was the newest thing four years ago. Uh, whereas the company heading continuing to do uh, things that would fulfill the mission of making it fun to do sports and motivate people to, to be active. Uh, and again, it's recreational people, people that want to, it's not elite sports runners. Or, um, but th there's a difference between starting and running. It's, it's different things. But I think one of the things is to try to have a starter mentality when you're running a company. But that is difficult. It's not, it's not easy. Yeah. Okay. We have a question in the back. Could you talk a bit about the challenges and issues in scaling up so you mentioned at some point you had 17 best friends and, and, uh, and family, but how do you sort of take it beyond that? What were some of the actions that you took in order to, to grow the user base? Yeah, uh, you're, you're when you're talking about scaling up, you're talking about the user base, not the company itself. Right. Yeah, user base. Um, so in the beginning, we, we spent a lot of time just walking around, talking to running clubs, biking clubs, going, I, I've probably been personally in, in every single bike store in Copenhagen with flyers telling them about how great this product is. When you sell a bike, tell people about it so they can track their commute bike to work. Um, we had, uh, we've had a lot of help from, uh, from running clubs, especially Sparta in, in, on Österbo in Copenhagen. Uh, using the products with their running teams and that way getting great ambassadors and then they started out really early um, giving feedback when the product was still very immature. Um, but back to your question on how do we scale up and when, when does the point come where you go from three users a day to 3,000 users a day or to 30,000 users a day? Um, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a lot of, lot of different things. I think the main thing that we have had was being featured on the app stores. Uh, that's, that is a driver that is almost impossible to beat anywhere else. And f featured on the app stores, by that I mean when you open up the app store, uh, then your app is on the front. It is something that is they are recommending. We were on Google Play as what they call editor's choice, which is I think 28 apps at least at that time. 
that they recommended. And that was a huge boost. How do you get there? It's, it's a lot of luck, a lot of hard work. We tried to do it by every time the platforms, meaning Apple or Google, uh, BlackBerry, came out with something new. Uh, we wanted to have features that would support that. So we so they could use it as a showcase. So we were on top of mind to okay they they want to show their new features whether it is a new connection to Bluetooth. Okay, we need to have a f a feature that supports Bluetooth because then Google might say oh we have uh, this good app and they now we can showcase. So that was what we tried to do and w we were successful in 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 doing that and getting getting some promotion. And just to put it in perspective, uh, we had one of our first big news articles was in the Times in London um, and we could see w the day that the paper came out and I don't know what the number of, of people reading the Times but it's it's uh, it's probably counted in almost two millions. Um, we had a spike in new members and it went from I think 600 to 640. So we basically got 40 extra members based on an article like that. Um, and of course that kind of press helps in the long run but it's not something you can see immediately. But you can, if you if you become featured on an app store, you would go from 30 members to 15,000 members per day overnight. Um, so we st we did spend a lot of time to talk to those people and to try to be friends with them and ask what what are the next thing they are going to come out with and how can we support that and those kind of things. Okay. Um, we have still several questions. Oh, yeah, Kirsten, uh, you seem to have a very uh, structured approach to the way you work. But as you also mentioned, uh, passion is key to making a business succeed. Could you describe how uh, your passion fails you? You mentioned that specifically and uh, how you find it again. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting and good question. Ed. Passion and motivation is when you have it, it's just you, you just run. There's nothing that can stop you. As soon as the motivation is gone, nothing can get you started again. Um, I think my passion is in the same areas, and that's not changing. I love sports. I love doing something that uh, makes it m more fun to do sports or working in those environments. If you have ever been to a road race, uh, very, very few people that are in a bad mood. Everyone likes to be there, and it's just a great environment to be in. Um, in terms of uh, of motivation, I think you need to have people around you because there will be tons of bad days. And in the beginning, we were about to stop the company at least 10 times every time a competitor came out. Google came out with a competing product. It was called Latitude. It was almost competing. And we thought, oh, okay, it's it's over. We We heard about it in the in some news Friday afternoon, that was the worst weekend. Then the next weekend, Google uh, and, and Nike Plus came out with that product. Oh, okay, now we're dead again. But then the weekend was horrible, and Monday, we are, oh, now we are going again. So there are a lot of um, times where motivation fails you, uh, and, and I think that's why it's really good to have a group of people that can support each other, and, and, and you, your curves on the motivation curve are luckily not following each other so s some days some will be on a high and some on a low and and you try to balance if everyone are on a low then that's a bad sign bad day but yeah um i think along with yeah. your i'm sorry i was going to just say that along with your motivation because of your background as a runner uh you know that there are days that you don't want to run but you must run so the ro you were talking about the passion and the i would say also your discipline must have also played a pretty strong role in that you know that you have to keep going through some things and even when the the more difficult days occur you you see the bigger picture you know you see that you want to run even though you maybe that day don't want to run so yeah to speak. and that will always be those days and uh, I'm not saying it, it it has been the most fun experience um, it is great fun to work with this stuff mm -hmm. but there are still days where it's it's rough less and fun. it's tough <laughs> and it's less fun and uh, and 
yeah, there is an end goal, and it's, it is just like running when you're preparing for the marathon. I'm yeah. sure the days where it's uh, minus four degrees and it's snowing, it's not the best day to get out there, but it'll be good tomorrow. Yeah. So. Yes. Hello, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question is... Um, I'm sorry, could you put the mic a little bit closer to your mouth? Yes, um, Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, first question is, um, you talk about a uh, advisor from Skype. H how did you meet him? Um, do you want me to answer the first? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Ma maybe I should yeah. say the second question. Okay, yeah. um, the second question is, uh, you talk about you, um, you recruited some uh, very uh, good developers. And uh, I'm just curious, how did you do that? Uh, uh, h how did you determine that? Uh, so the first question in terms of advisors, and I will just broadly answer that question. I, I think it is super important, and that's back to the motivational question. Meeting with people that are doing other things, just to share all the, you, you need to complain, you need to share the bad ideas, uh, the bad days, and you can't really share that with too many people because most people don't understand that you, they see you have a good product, how can you have a bad day? Uh, sharing that with people who are in it themselves is great. And that's also where you find uh, people that can advise and you can connect with those people. And we spent so much time on that, which is great. So, <coughs> and, and some of them that have done great startups are now in the venture capital world, maybe. Uh, they will not invest, but they can still be great assets in terms of just people to bounce ideas or to discuss or to get some insights or inputs. So that, that was your first question. The second question. Uh, just, uh, call yeah, call yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, call people now. are uh, very, very good at helping each other. I, I don't think I've ever met anyone saying, yeah, we met one person that said, no, I, I don't care about running. I'm not going to help you. And a year later, the same person, it's a very, uh, it's a famous IT entrepreneur. And a year later, he, he said, wow, it's actually cool. And uh, then he was helping. <laughs> but he was just being honest that I don't care about running. F fine, fair. And a year later, he did care a lot about running. Um, <laughs> uh, because people also change. They, uh, they, they, they want to change their habits. Uh, um, but I've called up people. Um, and the same goes for, and, and a lot of times you never get through. People don't answer your emails, but when they do, I would say 99.999% of the time people want to help. It's about, and then it's about time. A lot of people don't have the time to help, but most people like to help and share their knowledge. And, uh, and, and I think we all here like that, to help other people. That's just a common uh, th uh, trait. Um, in terms of finding the good developers, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for everyone. I, I have yet to meet a company that's saying that's easy to find good developers. Um, I think even the big flagship tech companies are struggling to find good people. Um, we, uh, our first, or yeah, the first developer is, was uh, one of my friends from high school, and I tried to pursue him to join us for a long time. He had a really good job, made good money, all those kind of things. Um, he was very, very good, and he was known for being very, very good. So getting him on board helped to get other people that wanted to work with him, and he had some good friends that were also good developers, and then creating that core group of good folks. And that's, that was, I think we succeeded in doing that. Of course, it's always difficult to keep on having that throughout the entire lifetime on any company, including the big tech players. But uh, we had the, um, the, the, the element of having a product that people who are runners or people who like to bike or whatever it is being active, they like to work with that. So we had an additional asset to just having to create something. Can I just ask you? Um, when you say a good developer, um, maybe for some of the audience out here, what, what makes a good developer? Or what was your checklist? That's a very long checklist. Um, okay, just short, the short list. The short <laughs> version is attitude. <laughs> it is having someone who is skilled and good at math and good at structuring the algorithms uh, mm -hmm. um, and just a super smart person. Uh, if they don't have the specific skills on developing for mm -hmm. iPhone, iOS, that's completely fine. Mm -hmm. If they are extremely good at, at it's a good, 
architect or a good um, good math person, mm -hmm. then they will learn that fairly quickly. Okay. Um, so I that was never so specific skill on the actual platform that had to develop. That was I don't think that has ever been on the list. Okay. For check marks. Okay. So we are about time. So uh, should we take? Yeah, take one last question. In the beginning, yeah, family and uh, friends financed in the Mondo. So when did you get like e external uh, venture capital and how did you get it? Um, we had um, e external capital, meaning also private individuals or uh, institutional investors. I can answer for both. Um, it's a it's it's a borderline. When is it a uh, family friend kind of investment, and when is it becoming uh, a non friend investment? Um, that I don't know. It's it's probably a, a very uh, um, uh, that that's a gray zone. Um, we got our first institutional investment from uh, from Seed Capital here, uh, located uh, here on campus. Mm. Um, at the I can remember I think we had around half a million users at that time, so that was kind of the 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 threshold um, I'm not sure they were the ones um, telling me twenty thousand users and then fifty thousand users and then hundred thousand but a lot of others were um, but that was that was the point when we uh, when we actually had probably a bigger recognition and a bigger brand name out of the first 500,000 users, I can't remember the numbers, but I would imagine probably 70% of them were in Denmark, or maybe between 50 and 70%. Uh, so that meant that it was more well known and it was, it was easier to get in talk about uh, a nice future for the company and thereby getting institutional investments. We tried a lot to get into institutional investments from U.S. and we also got some uh, offers, uh, but it's uh, it's very hard when we are when you're not located there um, to actually get in touch with the right people, and it takes a lot of time to build that I don't know trust or network with institutional investors. Okay, well that is. <laughs> Sorry, well, my throat. That is going to uh, wrap it up for today. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed uh, our talk with Christian. I was very inspired. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. And Anna, do you have something that you'd like to say before, uh, before we leave? I would just like to say thank you also. It was very inspiring, and I'm glad that you made it to Denmark this time. And I'm happy, happy about all the exercise I had uh, jumping forward to the, all the good questions. Did you track uh, it? I didn't track <laughs> it. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I will next time. Um, but great to see you and hope to see you for other events. We have other alumni events, so please go online, check our event calendar, check us out at Facebook and LinkedIn. So um, have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.